Who, who would like to hear some poetry this evening? Okay, welcome to the Tabula Poetica reading series. Please pull out your phone and tweet or Facebook that you're here having a great time and then silence your phone. I, I like my their, your response choir over here. Uh, later this fall, Tabula Poetica will feature Genevieve Kaplan, and then our final reading is a reading by our own MFA students. We're also going to have a special lecture in December, and I believe that's scheduled right back here in the Center for American War Letters uh, by Presidential Fellow Carolyn Forche. Cool, huh? Um, <laughs> Most of the support for the visiting poets for the whole series and for the International Journal tab comes from the Department of English. I especially want to thank our department chair, Joanna Levin, and our administrative assistants, Kristen Laxo and David Krausman, and our grad assistant, Mike Gravano. Of all those people, I think only Mike is here. So let's give Mike a round of applause. <laughs> Leatherby Libraries, where we all are right now, and the Dean of Leatherby Library, Char Charlene Baldwin. Um, <laughs> fantastic supporter of poetry. So Leatherby Libraries, Fish Interface Center, and Poets and Writers are all fantastic uh, sponsors for what we do here at Tabula Poetica for the talks and the readings. Today's Visiting Poet has been sponsored by Richard Bausch's Special Program Building Fund, and we're incredibly grateful for his investment in the literary culture that we have here at Chapman and also in the community and globally. Um, his reach is far. And he's the one who came back a year ago from a workshop and said, hey, you know this Ada Limon? We really need to get her to Chapman. Let's do this. And so uh, he made this happen, and he is going to introduce the poet. Before he does that, I want to say that there is food in the back, so help yourselves. Definitely drink up the wine, thanks to Charlene Baldwin, our, our now favorite dean. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we have the bookstore here, so if you don't have a copy of Bright Dead Things, it's a beautiful book and we have it for sale over here on the side. So I'm going to turn the podium over to the amazing Richard Bausch, and he's going to introduce the poet. Here's Ada. No. <laughs> Do I have to hold this? Can you hear me? It's only for the video. Oh. <laughs> it's about the size of a booger. So I don't know. Um, was that unpoetic of me? Uh, before I say anything else, I want to say that um, two things. Anna Leahy is such an asset to this school and to everything we do. And uh, she puts this together every year, effort it seems effortlessly. You never see the strain of it on her. She's a great poet herself. And I want everybody here to, to give a big round of applause. Um, uh, and the other is uh, that I have to say, finally, is um, there is no greater heart at this university in the love of writers and writing and expression and all the rest of it than Charlene Baldwin, who allows us to use this room and who always provides us with all the best things. This is for Charlene. Everybody. Now, um, before I actually introduce this poet, whom you will never forget, um, I have to tell you a little story because that's what I do. Um, uh, this is an absolutely true story, and it has to do with our place, with the writer's place in America. Uh, the writer John Hassler, pretty good novelist, was working in a cabin up in the wilderness in, Min in Minnesota on his novel, and something very bad went wrong with the sump pump, and so he had to call a plumber, and the plumber came in, and the plumber was working while he was trying to do his own work, and the plumber is standing up to his ankles in raw sewage, oh. 
and he said, and wiping it off the walls, and he <laughs> says to to uh, Hassler, "You're that writer guy from Minneapolis, right?" And Hassler says, "Yeah." And the plumber says, "I don't know how you can do that kind of work." <laughs> <laughs> so I was at the Tomales Bay Writers Conference, and I went to the reading, and Ada Limon was reading. She read her first poem, and I was tired and faintly not in the mood to go to a poetry reading. And the poem washed over me, and I thought, whoa. And so I sat up, and instead of politely sitting there, all of a sudden I was avidly sitting there. And every poem she read did that or more to me, and I thought, my God, this woman is a great poet. And I went immediately to the phone and called Anna and said, I have just heard a poet read. We have to bring her to Chapman. And uh, I didn't even know Ada. I just knew the work. And I went up afterwards and introduced myself and said, I hope that you do readings. And she says, yeah, I do. And I said, well, I'd love to bring you to Chapman at, at, in Southern California to give a reading. She says, sure, that'd be fun. So I felt and still feel rather triumphant about the whole thing that I'm responsible <laughs> for this. But um, she is just such a wonderful poet. The poems are musical. They're full. They're textured in a way that doesn't announce itself as texture, but it's there. And when you finish the poem, you feel Encoosed, as if somebody has branded it on the inside of your skull, and you know you're never going to forget it. And uh, everyone, one after another after another, they're just amazing poems. So I'm so happy to be able to share this poet with you all. Here is my friend Ada Limon. How's everyone doing? You holding in? You hanging in okay? Yeah. It's been a day, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's so nice to be here. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, and thank you, Anna, for everything that you do to put this together. Um, I, I'm going to read, I think, 12 poems. Um, I say that so that you have some semblance of control. <laughs> over your life right now. So that if you like what you hear, you can say, okay, great, there's four more. And if you hate what you can hear, you can just start counting down. Um, I'm gonna read, uh, it's gonna be a little different in the sense that I'm gonna read only six from Bright Dead Things and then I'm gonna read six new ones. Um, and the six new ones are from a new book that I just sold and um, will be out September 2018. And uh, so I'm kind of enthralled by it because it just came together. So I thought, you know, we've got to share it. But I'm going to start with this poem um, that those of you who've heard me read before will know it. And, and, but I feel like I needed something a little bit courageous to bring me into the room tonight. This is about the, uh, the day the Phillies race, which is the Oaks Day, which is the day before the Derby. Um, and it's when all the, the female horses race. How to triumph like a girl. I like the lady horses best. How they make it all look easy. Like running 40 miles per hour is as fun as taking a nap or grass. I like their lady horse swagger after winning. Ears up, girls, ears up. <laughs> but mainly, let's be honest, I like that they're ladies. As if this big, dangerous animal is also a part of me. That somewhere inside the delicate skin of my body, there pumps an eight-pound female horse heart. Giant with power, heavy, with blood. Don't you want to believe it? 
Don't you want to lift my shirt and see the huge, beating, genius machine that thinks, no, it knows it's going to come in first. Um, it's a poem for the ladies. <laughs> um, I went to visit Victoria's uh, class today, and um, they gave me some requests, so I thought I would honor that. This poem was requested, and I think I think it is a good poem for today. Um, because I have realized, and those of you that heard me talk today at 2.30, that I've realized that I feel like I can't be in a room with people without sort of grieving first. And then we can kind of move on, but we have to grieve. And um, so this poem is about grieving. Downhearted. Six horses died in a tractor trailer fire. There. That's the hard part. I wanted to tell you straight away so we could grieve together. So many sad things, that's just one on a long recent list that loops and elongates in the chest, in the diaphragm, in the alveoli. What is it they say? Heart sick or downhearted? I picture a heart lying on the floor of the torso, pulling up the blankets over its head, thinking this pain will go on forever, even though it won't. The heart is watching Lifetime movies and wishing and missing all the good parts of her that she has forgotten. The heart is so tired of beating herself up, she wants to stop it still. But also she wants the blood to return, wants to bring in the thrill and wind of the ride, the fast pull of life driving underneath her. What the heart wants? The heart wants her horses back. Thank you. Um, to stay in a moment of grief, uh, Richard asked me to read this poem. Um, the second section of this book deals with the de death of my dear stepmother, um, who was a mother figure in my life um, from eight um, until uh, 30, I don't know, until 2010. <laughs> um, she died of colon cancer and at 52 and um, was sick for six years and so it was an ongoing uh, process and I went home and took leave off of my job and they actually were remarkable and gave me a month and just said go home and you know be okay and so I was, got to be there uh, with my father, and it was uh, my father and I, and somewhat my little brother, although it was, I think, a little bit more on our shoulders uh, to handle her passing. So this poem is about that. I will say also that it begins with a conversation with my mother, my actual mother, and then switches back. And when I say C died, I'm talking about my stepmother, just so that you know there's two, two women. Relentless. Sun in the cool expressway underpass air and Ma calls to say it's nice out today during her long walk through the vineyard where springs pushed out every tizzy-tongued flower known to the valley's bosom of light. I say, look, we're talking about the weather. And she says, you know, it does help you to see the person you're talking to. <laughs> the difference in a wind-blown winter's walk in January cold and the loose steps of sun on far-off shoulders. Then I say, now we're talking about talking about the weather. It's very meta of us. <laughs> yes, she says, we could go on like this forever. And it's been exactly two months since C died, my hands holding her head, odd, extraordinary February sun gone down on the smooth slope of green grass, and all my father and I had done all day was talk about two things, the weather and her breathing, the machine body gone harsh in its prolonging and the loud gasping sigh of dying, thick as a hawk's cry, breaking out in the cloudless atmosphere. 
some impossibly still moment we stood looking at the long field's pull and we wanted her to die for her sake, wanted the motor of the body to give up and go. How strange this silent longing for death as if you could make the sun not come up the world's wheeling and wheeling its seasons like a cruel continuation of stubborn force. But that's not how it happens. Instead, light escapes from the heart's room, and for a moment you believe the clock will stop itself. Absence. You see, light escapes from a body at night, and in the morning, Despite the oppressive vacancy of the leaving shadow, light comes up over the mountains, and it is, and it is, and it is. Just doing a little grieving together. Um... I'm going to read this poem uh, that was also requested in the MFA class I visited, which was, um, there were so many poems at the time that were about people's marriages and love. And um, I had been in love, but I wanted to celebrate the different ways that love can be. And also to celebrate even loves that had lost because I thought, that's important too, and that has value, right? So this poem sort of became a, a poem that was for, uh, for those of us that may not have that one singular thing to celebrate, but maybe we have lots of failed and triumphant failures in there. Um, glow. In the black, illegible moment of foolish want, there is also a neon sign flashing, the sign above the strip joint where my second big love worked as a bouncer and saved the girls from unwanted hands, unpaid-for hands, thin-lipped ladies with a lot on their minds and more on their backs, loaded for bear and for the long winter's rain, loaded for real, and I've always been a jealous girl but when he'd come home with a 4 a.m. stomp in his boots and undressed to bed, he was fully there, fully in the room. My sleeping body made awake, awake, and there was a gentleness to this, a long opening that seemed to join us in the saddest hour. Before now, I don't know if I have ever loved anyone or if I have ever been loved, but men have been very good to me have seen my absurd out-of-placeness, my bent grin, an uncalled-for loud laugh, and have wanted to love me for it, have been so warm in their wanting that sometimes I wanted to love them too. And I think that must be worth something, that it should be a celebrated thing, that though I have not stood on a mountain under the usual false archway of tradition and chosen one person forever, what I have done is risked everything for that hour, that hour in the black night where one flashing light looks like love. I have pulled over my body's car and let myself believe that the dance was only for me that this gift of a breathing one who once was always a gift was the only sign worth stopping for, that the neon glow was a real star gleaming in its dying, like us all, like us all. I will tell you, I, I don't often name drop, but do you know the, po the poet Terence Hayes? Yeah. That's Terence Hayes' favorite poem of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write that in the next, the fifth edition. I'm going to be like, Terence Hayes approves of this poem. Um, this is a, a poem that kind of is a, a sister poem to that poem, which is uh, 
that it's about sort of all the things the heart has been before it found love. Adaptation. It was, for a time, a loud, twittering flight of psychedelic colored canaries, a cloud of startle and get out in the ornamental irons of the rib cage. Nights when the moon was wide like a great eye of a universal beast coming close for a kill. It was a cave of bitten bones and snakeskins, eggshell dust and charred scraps of frozen over flames. All the things it has been, kitchen knife and the ancient carp's frown, cavern of rust and worms in the airless tire swing, cactus barb, cut down tree, dead cat in the plastic crate, still how the great middle ticker marched on. And from all its four chambers to all its forgiveness, unlocked the sternum's door, reversed and reshaped until it was a new, bright, carnal species, more accustomed to grief and ecstatic at the sight of you. Um, I think that was five. <laughs> Was it six? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read uh, the last poem of Bright Dead Things, um, which was, it, it's a poem I wrote when, you know how everybody always says, you know, things are going to get better. <laughs> and then you just sort of have a moment where you're like, what if they don't? <laughs> and this is my response to that. The conditional. Say tomorrow doesn't come. Say the moon becomes an icy pit. Say the sweet gum tree is petrified. Say the sun's a foul black tire fire. Say the owl's eyes are pinpricks. Say the raccoon's a hot tar stain. Say the shirt's plastic ditch litter. Say the kitchen's a cow's corpse. Say we never get to see it. Bright star, bright future, stuck like a bum star, never coming close, never dazzling. Say we never meet her, never him. Say we spend our last moments staring at each other, ha hands knotted together, clutching the dog, watching the sky burn. Say it doesn't matter. Say that would be enough. Say. You'd still want this, us, alive, right here, feeling lucky. Um, and then I'm going to uh, move to six poems from the new book. Uh, I get to say book now <laughs> instead of word processing document. <laughs> um, and five books seems crazy to me, but I can't stop writing. <laughs> it just happens. Um, let's start with this poem, which I will say uh, is just the way I feel about this song. A new national anthem. The truth is, I've never cared for the national anthem. <laughs> if you think about it, it's not a good song. <laughs> it's too high for most of us, with the rocket's red glare. And then there are the bombs. Always, always, there's war and bombs. Once I sang it at homecoming and threw even the tenacious high school band off key. But the song didn't mean anything. Just a call to the field, something to get through before the pummeling of youth. And what of the stanzas we never sing? The third that mentions no refuge could save the hireling or the slave. Perhaps the truth is, every song of this country has an unsung third stanza. Something brutal, snaking underneath us as we blindly sing the high notes with a beer sloshing in the stands, hoping our team wins. Don't get me wrong. 
I do like the flag. How it undulates in the wind like water, elemental, and best when it's humbled, brought to its knees, clung to by someone who has lost everything, when it's not a weapon, when it flickers, when it folds up so perfectly you can keep it until it's needed, until you can love it again, until the song in your mouth feels like sustenance, a song where the notes are sung by even the ageless woods, the short grass plains, the Red River Gorge, the fistful of land left that's unpoisoned, the song that's our birthright, that's sung like someone's rough fingers weaving through another's, that sounds like a match being lit in an endless cave, the song that says my bones are your bones and your bones are my bones and isn't that enough? Thank you. Um, this, uh, it has been such a gift to be here that, um, but I will say that sometimes you get invited to places and you realize what you're there for. And some of you may know what I'm talking about. And this poem is about that. The contract says we'd like the conversation to be bilingual. <laughs> When you come, bring your brownness so we can make sure to please the funders. Will you check this box? We're applying for a grant. Do you have any poems that speak to troubled teens? Bilingual is best. Would you like to come to dinner with the patrons and sip Patron? Will you tell us the stories that make us uncomfortable but not complicit? <laughs> Don't read us the one where you are just like us. Born to a greenhouse garden. Don't tell us how you picked tomatoes and ate them in the dirt, watching vultures pick apart another bird's bones in the road. Tell us the one about your father stealing hubcaps after a colleague said that's what his kind did. Tell us how he came to the meeting wearing a poncho and tried to sell the man his hubcaps back. Don't mention your father was a teacher, spoke English, loved making beer, loved baseball. Tell us again about the poncho, the hubcaps, how he stole them, how he did the thing he was trying to prove he didn't do. Um, The new book deals uh, somewhat with fertility, and uh, so this poem is a is a, a poem about going to a fertility clinic, and um, at the same time, what I was seeing sort of as I as I went there. The vulture and the body. On my way to the fertility clinic, I pass five dead animals. First, a raccoon with all four paws to the sky, like he's going to catch whatever bullshit load falls on him next. <laughs> then, a grown coyote, his furred golden body soft against the white cement lip of the traffic barrier. Trickster no longer, an eye closed to what's coming. Close to the sign that says, Florence, y'all, and means I'm near Cincinnati, but still in the bluegrass state, and close to my exit, I see three dead deer, all staggered but together. And I realize as I speed past in my death machine that they're a family. I say something to myself that's in between a prayer and a curse. How dare we live on this earth? I want to tell my doctor about how we all hold a duality in our minds, futures entirely different, footloose or forged. I want to tell him how lately it's enough to be reminded that my body is not just my body, but that I'm made of old stars and so's he. And that last Tuesday I sat alone in a car by the post office and just was for a whole hour, no one knowing how to find me, until I got out, the sound of the car door shutting like a gun and mailed letters, all of them saying, thank you. But in the clinic, 
the sonogram wand showing my follicles. He asks if I have any questions and says, things are getting exciting. I want to say, but what about all the dead animals? The earth, our trapped bodies. But he goes quicksilver and I'm left to pull my panties up like a big girl. Some days there's a violent sister inside of me and a red ladder that wants to go elsewhere. I drive home on the other side of the road, going south now. The white coat has said I'm ready, and I watch as a vulture crosses over me, heading toward the carcasses I haven't properly mourned or even forgiven. What if, instead of carrying a child, I am supposed to carry grief? The great black scavenger flies parallel now, each of us speeding intently and driven toward what we've been taught to do with death. Um, this is a poem that uh, I wrote for a, a fellow poet, but I'm scared he might not be my friend after this. <laughs> Um, but I also feel like he needs to know. <laughs> Mastering. I'm in Texas at a bar with a friend who doesn't drink, and I've missed him. We order food and share our talk about aging bodies in Mexico and how the mind goes mad. We talk about a friend who's going blind, the pressure on his brain, how much we admire his fierce allegiance to the world, his unflagging wail into the abyss. I like being at this bar with a man I admire but don't love, don't need to fleece for affection. It makes me feel all grown up, like I should get a good job chip too. We talk about marriage and the tender skin of the other, I lay out the plans for my upcoming wedding. A mountain named after the moon blooms in my hair, my beloved. We've known each other almost 15 years, my friend, with eyes the color of a cenote. I trust him. He leans in, tells me the real miracle, more than marriage, the thing that makes you believe there might be a God after all is the making of a child. He stares at me, but I'm not there anymore. I don't say, we've tried a long time, been sad, been happy, that perhaps the only thing I can make is love and art. I want to tell him that's enough, isn't it? Isn't love that doesn't result in a seed, a needy body, another suckling animal still love? Isn't that supernatural? Screw your God. He's showing me a photo of his child and I'm unfolding and folding the napkin. He's pointing out how, how amazing his child is. I order a drink <laughs> because I can and maybe because he can't. He retreats in his seat. I take a long sip and really look into his eyes. I want him to notice what he said, how a woman might feel agony, emptiness, how he's lucky it's me he said it to because I won't vaporize him. <laughs> I sip again. I want him to see how much pleasure I can handle. My tongue a tuning fork, how mute and mirror I can be, even with these ordinary wonders he can't see swirling all around us. What do you think? You think he's going to forgive me for that one? <laughs> I don't hear a, a yes, actually. Um, all right, so I'm going to read two more poems. What will they be? Um, my, uh, my father in law has Alzheimer's, and um, those of you who have dealt with that in the past know it's pretty intense. And uh, this poem is about that. Losing. 
After your father gets lost for the third time, you get angry because he won't answer his phone. Part of me wants him to stay lost. God would have stolen my generosity. He pours a bowl of cereal and milk and leaves the refrigerator door open. He calls you boss and me mother. Yes, mother, he says, and rolls his eyes when I tell him to eat something to clean up after himself. Would I be more patient with a child? Would I love the smallness of a life more than the goneness of the mind? Yes. I don't know what to do with him, so I cook elaborately, pea salad with blanched red onions, radishes and asparagus, scalloped potatoes, all good things that come from the ground. He eats the mini eggs that I've left for guests until they're gone. He says, how do you feel about abortion? I explain how you can eat violets and dandelions and wild chives so that we almost have an edible lawn. He says he hates birds. I laugh and ask him, how can you hate birds? He says he hates them because they're everywhere. They're all over, everywhere you look. And we look up to the sky together. Turns out he's right. Those damn things are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know I said one more but I think I'm going to do two more so I can end on a love poem okay um, this is another uh, it's a, this is a prose poem it's also about um, my father-in-law um, and also about my, my husband who is uh, so kind um, his girlfriend passed away and he went to go get her cats because no one would take them. This is sort of, sort of a poem about that. The Last Drop. You've just left your dad in Virginia with your brother after taking him to the neurologist to confirm that it is in fact Alzheimer's. Now you're driving to New York to get your dead ex-girlfriend's cats who need a home and even though we weren't planning on cats, they're 15 and who's going to take them and you know them already and why not give some animals a home even if it's another 20 hours of driving there and back? I tell Manuel about your travels and he says, it's a good premise for a horrible road trip dark comedy movie. <laughs> and there is something funny about it all. Your father hates cats, but they love him. And I spent a long time envious of your ex-girlfriend's beauty, and now I only miss her and want to love her cats for her. My memoir could be titled, Everything Was Fine Until It Wasn't. My memoir could be called, I Thought I Wanted a Baby, But All I Got Was Your Dead Ex-Girlfriend's Two Old Cats. <laughs> My memoir could be called, Before the Wedding, You Must Suffer a Little. My mother's motto is, nothing is easy, and I tease her for it, but it's true. Before he left, your dad said he didn't understand the saying, good to the last drop. Does that mean the last drop is bad, he asked. No, I reassured. It means all of it is good. Every single drop of it is good. <laughs> um, I'm going to end with a love poem. Um, which one? Um, <laughs> I um, laugh that so I'm on the road a lot and I do a lot of readings and um, you know Lucas will see pictures of me kind of dressed up and you know then I get home and I'm just like wearing the same clothes <laughs> and I totally just kind of fall apart and melt and I was thinking about it, and I was telling Kevin Young about it, and I said, I have to write this poem. Uh, love poem with the apologies for my appearance. <laughs> Sometimes I think you get the worst of me. The much-loved loose forest green sweatpants, the long braless days, hair knotted and uncivilized, a shadowed brow where the devilish thoughts do their hoofed dance on the brain, I'd like to say this means I love you. <laughs> the stained white cotton t-shirt, the tears, pistachio shells, <laughs> the mess of orange peels on my desk. But it's different than that. I move in this house with you the way I move in my mind. 
unencumbered by beauty's cage. I do like I do in the tall grass, more animal me than much else. I'm wrong. It is that I love you, but it's more that when you say it back, lights out a cold wind through curtains for maybe the first time in my life. I believe it. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Yes? Do you see your work as an evolution? You read to us as though it were an evolution mm. from the, the subject matter of the early poems mm -hmm. through the social justice and then to the more, I don't know, uh, uh, real life of life and humor. Mm -hmm. Way, or am I just seeing that because of the selection of the poems? Mm. No, I think, um, I mean, I write autobiographical poems, and I think it would be impossible for it not to be an evolution unless I remained the same person. Um, <laughs> um, but I don't think I'll be the same person tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Um, sometimes the shift is larger. And sometimes the shift is smaller. But I think it is um, a narrative that sort of goes with the growing daily life of the author, <laughs> the speaker. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Did you just say Staple and Aldi got home to your friend's doorstep? Oh, you know, um, I don't think he's read it yet. Take it to his doorstep and then read it there. Coming out in the Virginia Quarterly Review, he will probably read it then. Um, I, I I don't know. I, I'm I'm I don't know. I think that it's, it's something he needs to hear. Um, he's a poet, so I feel like there's a level where he's going to get it. You know, um, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> what? I think you have to be. Yeah, I think if I want to write the poem and I want it out there, I have to, I have to be accountable. I think in your 40s, already heard it. Mm -hmm. There was this one point when he was sitting back, mm -hmm. and I got the sense he understood at some point mm -hmm. the word mm -hmm. I hope so. <laughs> I would like to believe your take on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember one of the first poems I wrote, and um, it was about um, bruising my chin trying to follow my father. Um, and I think I was probably 10 or 11. And it was very short lines. And actually, you know, it's not bad. <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, but like first, you like for a, a, a small child, it's like yeah, this is like there's some there's some stuff there. There is also poems that I you know that are like holiday poems that like like you know printed on a plate. You know when they used to do those like drawing on the white plate. Yeah, those are pretty terrible. It's like love is a dove above. You know, it's like all that. Mm -hmm. and how your, how your process has evolved or, or what kinds of things you do now in terms of moving from the blank page to an actual poem? Right. Um, I think for me, my, my process is, you know, I write something every day. Um, I take notes all throughout the day, things that are interesting, things that, because I used to trust that I would remember those things. Like, of course, like, of course I'm going to remember that cool statement, or of course I'm going to remember that sign, or, and then I realized, like, that just doesn't happen. Um, 
And so now I just take, I make sure that I remember all that and I take notes. And I used to also just think, oh, this one line will remind me of the whole poem I had in my head. Now I realize that's not true. So now it's like the, you know, the notes become a little more um, complex because I want to make sure I remember the situation and wh how, they're, how they're equating to one another. Um, so uh, I take a lot of notes. And then when I do have time and it, I have moments to myself and I actually feel the urge, I sit down and, and try to get a full thing out, usually within an hour or two. Um, and then often, if it doesn't come out complete, um, and I, I also compose out loud, which is a different way of writing in the sense that I read every, almost every single line out loud um, and over and over and over and over and over again. So people sometimes will say, the new poems sound like you've read them 20 times. And even like, like some of these I've only read to an audience like once before, if not at all. Um, and the reason they sound like I've read them a lot is because I have read them a lot, but just that's how I compose. That's how I write. So they sound like they're, polished in the sense of the RL tradition just because that's what I'm, that's how I compose. Um, so, and then oftentimes I don't revise right away. Uh, I, I usually put it in away for about a week or even a month. And that's when I go back and I'll do the tinkering that makes it finished. Um, because if I try to revise when I'm still in composer brain, I ruin it. <laughs> I always do. I suddenly just like trash it. So. That's part of my process. Yeah. I think the other thing is, is that I give myself time. It's, I mean, it's hard if you're in school and you're actually reaching deadlines, but I give myself time if I don't feel like some producing. Um, I just think that we live in a society where um, everything is about producing. Um, you know, the, the nice thing about being a poet is that no one's really <laughs> waiting for your next poem. <laughs> um, so <laughs> you have plenty of time. <laughs> and um, that sort of, there's no pressure to, to really, you know, to create something. Um, so that when you do create something, it's something that you value and something that's important um, and that matters. Um, and to me, I, I want my poems to matter, even if there's some funniness, even if there's something, I want them to be about the big ticket stuff. Uh, it, makes, it makes a difference to me to have them uh, feel like they are compelled to be in the world, not just that I'm putting them there for art's sake. So sometimes that means I need to take time. Yeah? Were you always um, writing poetry, or did you ever try to write anything else? Um, I have written uh, one uh, novel, and it's pretty terrible. And then I wrote a YA book uh, that I finished, I think, last year. And it's also pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so those are just in a box in my basement. But I really like the exercise of doing it. I feel like it's, um, I love storytelling. So for me, I think that's, that it's really fun. I don't think I'm super gifted at that. Um, I think my most authentic voice is my poetry voice. Uh, maybe creative nonfiction lends itself for a crossover for me. Um, but I really, I, but I still will do it. Like, I, like if someone asked me to be like, oh, write it, I would still try a hand at something. I just know I'm not great at it, <laughs> but I enjoy it. You know, it's the same way I feel about playing the guitar. Like, I'd be like, sure, but I'm terrible at it. So I still do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know he wants to see them. I'm like, no. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I'll try again. <laughs> thank you guys so much for tonight. It was a hard night to come out, so thank you.
terms of the space and the food. So hang out for a bit. There's food in the back, there's wine to the side, and there are books for sale on this side, and we can place the poet over here if you want to get a book signed. Sounds good.